welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the FNX Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and on this edition, we'll be looking back at the uh, narrow victory up at Huddersfield Town, Arsenal 2, Huddersfield Town 1. I know we're going to be a wayside. I should have said that the other way around, really. Huddersfield Town 1, Arsenal 2, for those of you who are a little bit anal about that sort of thing um, make sure we get that right now on the show we'll be talking about that performance we'll be talking about Jamie Carragher's comments where he says that Maurizio Sarri has turned Chelsea into Arsenal we'll be talking about Aaron Ramsey's huge money contract uh, at Juventus he is off we've got confirmation of that now although it's not been officially announced by Juventus themselves it's as good as uh, being done and we'll be talking about fans abusing players via social media so an action packed show for you this week and also joining me a little bit later on is Patrick D'Angelo a producer down at TalkSport uh, he covers the sports bar on weeknights and I met Patrick a few weeks ago when I had the pleasure of going down there and jumping on the show with the lads so uh, Patrick's brilliant and he'll be sharing his thoughts on some of the topics I've just touched on don't forget this show is sponsored by loserpool.com a fantastic new gaming site head over there for more information and details on how you can win a fantastic cash prize do check it out it's definitely worth your while now let's talk about the win up at Huddersfield Town Hardly the most inspiring of Arsenal performances, it's got to be said. Um, you know, there were many of us sort of sitting there watching that and thinking, you know, the performance wasn't great. But at the end of the day, it's the points that matter, isn't it? And I, I said previously that this was a huge weekend for us, given that Chelsea had a daunting task of going to the Etihad or the Empty Had, whatever you want to call it, to take on Pep's Manchester City. I felt that this was a weekend that Arsenal needed to capitalise on and fortunately we did um, even if the performance wasn't an inspiring one even if it wasn't great uh, you know it wasn't very polished it was pretty average to be honest I think maybe average is is being a little bit kind I thought Huddersfield will probably feel they deserved at least a point from that game they created some chances particularly in the second half um, arguably should have had a penalty in the first half when the ball struck Laurent Koscielny's arm now you know, I, I'm all for the fact that uh, handballs should only be given when they're deliberate. But if I was a Huddersfield supporter looking at that, I would be screaming out, you know, Koscielny's arm is not in a natural position, is it? it? It looks awkward. It looks as though, I'm not saying he intentionally played the ball with his hand, but the way, the place he's got his hand, the positioning of his hand kind of makes it look like a penalty. And if I was the referee on the day, probably would have given that to be honest let me know what you guys think on that at chronicles underscore afc via twitter or you can email me chronicles afc at gmail.com so we started off the game mm, not great but you know we scored after 16 minutes alex iwobi's deflected volley gave us the lead and i think what that displayed and what this game displayed overall actually was what an influence henrik mkhitaryan can have on this side i I don't know if it's because Henrik Mkhitaryan is good or because we've just been so lacking in quality in that particular position over the last few months, last few weeks, that just having someone capable of picking out a good pass, a devastating pass, or that pass that opens things up for you, we're just over overrating Henrik Mkhitaryan's performance. That could certainly be the case. I, I don't know. Um, again, let me know what you guys think on that. But it was his pass, wasn't it, that freed Sad Kalasinac down that left-hand side. And he's been brilliant in an attacking sense all season. He had the, the composure, the vision, the awareness to, to pick out Alex Iwobi the way he did. And Iwobi swung a boot at it. It seemed like quite a controlled volley. Um, he seemed to have the ball under control, but it didn't strike me as the type of volley that was going to end up in the back of the net. It, it seemed a bit soft. It seemed like it lacked that venom, but it took a massive deflection, didn't it? Wrong-footed the goalkeeper and ended up going in at the near post. So happy days, Arsenal 1-0 up. And I think when you look at that team that played on Saturday, I think there's probably nobody that needed a goal more than Alex Iwobi, someone that's been getting pelters from the fan base of late, people saying he's not good enough, that he's got no end product. And, you know, in some ways, I agree with the, the no product thing. I agree that 
He flatters to deceive at times. But what Alex Iwobi does is he gives you work rate. Alex Iwobi gives you um, the ability to carry the ball. He's hard working. He's quite strong at times. Um, and, and I think he's kind of like 70% of the way there to being a top player. He's just missing that final piece of the jigsaw and that would be the finish or the final pass. For me, he doesn't do those things often enough. Um, but saying that, he's actually had a goal, uh, a hand in 10 goals this season. So that's either an assist or a goal. I think he scored four um, and assisted six, or it might be the other way around, but I, I'm pretty sure that's right. Scored four, assisted six. So Alex Iwobi has improved in that department has he improved enough though to warrant him starting in the team every week that's the debate isn't it that is the question uh, that people are asking at the moment so l looking at the, the the way the game unfolded you know we took the lead on 16 minutes we didn't play particularly well after that but then you know right on the stroke of half time another brilliant move Ainsley Maitland-Niles getting forward at right wing back he put a delightful ball across the penalty area and Alex Lacazette finished it expertly. Now, you know, I guess you should say that from that distance, a striker should be putting that in the net. But what impressed me about that was, as a striker, it's very easy, isn't it, to, to get carried away and swing your boot at it that wildly and blaze it over the bar or play it wide. But Alexander Lacazette just kind of controlled that finish. It was really um, expertly done. It was as though he just stiffened his ankle enough for the ball to come off off the foot and find the net. You know, it had power in the shot, but the power had come from the cross. It was a really, really controlled finish. And, you know, that's the kind of expert finish that we've come to, to see from Alex Lacazette. And he's a player that consistently produces at the moment for Arsenal. He's probably my favourite player at the moment. I know I've said that on recent shows, but he deserves all the praise he's getting at the moment. Um so 2-0 at half time, and you're thinking, you know, this game's done and dusted. You're expecting Arsenal to come out in the second half and grab a foothold of the game and, and dominate and maybe go on and score two, uh, two more maybe. Uh, don't know if that's me being overambitious, but that didn't happen. Arsenal came out in the second half, lacklustre again. Um, Huddersfield obviously deserves immense credit for the way they played. They've got a new manager, as I mentioned in the preview show, and I spoke about my lack of knowledge for his style and, and my lack of understanding in terms of the way he he performs and uh, his, his way of playing. But he obviously is getting more out of this group of players. And I don't know, that's no fault of David Wagner's. I think he's done a fantastic job. But sometimes just a shake-up and, a, and a, a refresher can can do wonders for a group of players. And that's kind of what's happened at Huddersfield Town, if you ask me. So they deserve immense credit for... Uh, their performance. But from an Arsenal point of view, you know, I know we conceded very late on uh, Kolasinac's own goal. And in fact, that was Huddersfield's first goal in 597 minutes of action. Their last goal coming when Steve Mounier scored against Burnley back in Jan. So uh, they're obviously a team lacking goals and, you know, we thought we'd help them out. Um, but from an Arsenal point of view, the disappointing thing was that we were unable to see the game out and keep a clean sheet. And I know we won the game and I know we didn't concede right until the, the latter stages, the dying stages of the match. But it's so frustrating, isn't it, that, you know, we are now the only side in the Premier League without an away clean sheet. That means, you know, the likes of Cardiff, Fulham, um, you know, who are battling at the very bottom of the Premier League table have managed that. They've managed to keep clean sheets away from home and Arsenal haven't. And I just think that is an astonishing statistic. Um, have Arsenal improved? I, I keep talking about this every week. Have we improved? You could argue that we've improved overall, but you certainly cannot argue that we've improved defensively. Um, and I know we've had lots of injury problems. And I know this week we were without Socrates. We're going to be without Bellerin for the rest of the season. But for me, Arsenal need to do more on the training field, more tactically, more work on the shape um, in order to, to make up for these issues. Because the way we're going, you know, we'd be kicking ourselves if, if we don't make the top four because of this lacklustre, slack defending that we seem to see week in, week out. Um, 
so yeah let me know what you guys think about that i just find it really really frustrating um it, it seems to be the same problems every week and it's not showing any signs of improving but just finally on the huddersfield game you know it's three points and like i said right at the top of the show it was all about making this weekend count given chelsea's fixture it was all about getting three points on the board um you know we've got the games with spurs and manchester united coming up very soon and you feel as though given the fixtures that the other teams have which where they have to play each other you do feel that even if we were to lose those two games even if we were to lose at wembley and get beaten by manchester united as long as we do the business against the so-called lower teams you know that we're going to come up against in the next few weeks we should be in with a real shout of making the Champions League. And that's the encouraging thing, isn't it? But Arsenal need to stay focused. Arsenal need to keep, um, you know, their call. They need to focus on the task in hand. Hopefully, you know, we've got the, the Barté Borisov games. No game this weekend, incidentally, which means there'll be no preview show this week, by the way, uh, just in case you're wondering. But what I'm trying to say is that if we get the points against those lower ranked sides, then we should do it. We should do it. Or we certainly have a great chance of doing it, given the, the fixtures that the others still have to play. So that's a positive. One point off the top four, that's massive. And the hope is that, you know, we get these Europa League ties out of the way. We progress. And this weekend gives us a chance to recharge our batteries. We can get our players back uh, fit and ready and start to have options to call upon from the bench again because I think that's been a real problem for Unai Emery he was praised so much at the beginning of the season for his ability to change games from the bench well you can't do that if you don't have the options available to you so that's a massive thing um, and, and hopefully fingers crossed the squad starts to get back together get stronger again and we can start um, you know influencing games from the bench and the likes of Alex Iwobi who for me are under immense pressure at the moment uh, him and Matteo Guendouzi is another one I feel who's starting to drop off a little bit because he's under so much pressure those players are too young to be in the firing line week in week out so having these options available getting everybody back fit will be massive you know from a from a, a number of standpoints a you can influence the game from the bench more b you take some of the youngsters out of the firing line you know, there, there's so many positives to come from having a big squad and a, and a competitive squad so Fingers crossed that is the case uh, come not this weekend, the weekend after. Now, this next subject is uh, to do with Jamie Carragher. Uh, he made some comments, didn't he, uh, during Sky Sports' coverage of, of Manchester City Chelsea, where he said at halftime that Maurizio Sarri had turned Chelsea into Arsenal. Now, at the time um, when he made those comments, I never took any issue with it. And the reason I didn't is because, let's be realistic, he's right, isn't he? He is right. Arsenal did... Um, you know, go to the big sides and roll over and get battered, thumped, whatever you want to call it, uh, regularly. So to to label a team with that sort of, you know, they're like the new Arsenal, it, it kind of is understandable as much as I don't like it. I get where he's coming from. But then as time went on, I started to think about it and I've had time to think about it today. The more I think about it, the more pissed off I get with it. And the reason I get pissed off is because I don't think that Jamie Carragher genuinely believes that. I think that Jamie Carragher is trying to deflect from the fact that Liverpool are about to be, you know, pegged back by Manchester City. Uh, and City are, in my view anyway, going to go on and retain their Premier League title. And it's just deflecting from the fact that Liverpool have, you know, dropped a few points of late uh, by saying that, you know, Chelsea have kind of rolled over, Chelsea are useless, Chelsea are this. Why not praise Manchester City, Jamie? Because on their day, they are a fantastic side. They're arguably the greatest side this division has ever seen. And I say that as an Arsenal fan, as someone who watched the Invincibles, that Manchester City team on its day is as strong and is as good and is as talented as any of the legendary teams that we can talk about. You know, the Chelsea side in 2005, the Arsenal Invincibles, the United side in 99. This City side is as good as any of those, yeah, in my view anyway. you know. So uh, I just felt that was a bit classless from Jamie Carragher. He's someone who prides himself on loyalty. And, you know, for me, that was a bit of a low blow. And, and there was absolutely no need for that. Right. Aaron Ramsey earlier on today announced that he will 
be joining Juventus Football Club. We all knew it. The story's been going around for a while. We knew that the deal was signed, uh, but we didn't know details of it. We still really don't know details of it. We're speculating. But I just want to read you Aaron Ramsey's statement, which I think is a classy one. It's not very long. Sometimes you see these long statements and you think, can I be bothered to read that? But, you know, he's he's been straight to the point here. I've met Aaron Ramsey a couple of times. He's not a man of many words, uh, if I'm being honest. So, um, you know, this is what he said. As you may have already heard, I've agreed a pre-contract with Juventus Football Club. I wanted to issue a personal statement for all the Arsenal fans who have been extremely loyal and supportive. You welcomed me as a teenager and have been there for me through all the highs and lows I've encountered during my time at the club. It is with a heavy heart that I leave after 11 incredible years in North London. Thank you. I will continue to give the team 100% and hope to finish the season strongly before heading on to my next chapter in Turin. I just want to wish Aaron Ramsey the best of luck because I've said it in previous shows. The level of professionalism shown by this guy, despite the fact that the club pulled his contract off, despite the club that he's been left out, uh, despite the club, despite the fact that he's been left out of the side so many times this season, he's continued to give his all to this football club and that deserves an immense amount of credit. So Aaron Ramsey, we wish you the best of luck. Uh, and if you want to find out how Aaron Ramsey gets on in Serie A next season, you can tune into my Simply Serie A podcast. Cheap little plug there. Uh, you can find it on Twitter at Simply Serie A or on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, uh, all the usual places. So do check that out. We'll be covering... Um, all things Serie A, but also as an Arsenal fan, I'll be paying particular attention to how Aaron Ramsey gets on there. Now, uh, one of the big, you know, talking points of this and around this announcement, sorry, is the fact that there are reports that Aaron Ramsey will be getting four hundred thousand pounds a week. Um, some outlets are reporting that that's not true, and it's more around the two fifty mark. Whatever it is, it's a huge amount of money. And I know there's no transfer fee involved, but to all of those who say that Aaron Ramsey is shit, to all of those who think that this player isn't good enough for us, look at that. One of the top clubs in Europe have come in um, and snapped him up and are willing to pay that sort of wage to him. I think it's a testament to how good a player Aaron Ramsey has been over the last few years. Uh, and, and he deserves this move. It's a big money move. He, it will be great for his family. But above all, you know, you can't say that this is purely for money because he's going to a stronger team than Arsenal. He's got a real chance of winning the Champions League, playing alongside Cristiano Ronaldo. And the likelihood is he's going to come away with a Scudetto. So fair play to Aaron Ramsey. It's a great move for him, both financially and from a football standpoint. So, you know, wish him all the best. And uh, I'm sad to see him go. Right now, just before I bring Patrick D'Angelo on uh, on the line, I want to get one more point in um, before my monologue ends. And that's about fans abusing players via social media. Obviously, lots of stories going around. Ainsley Maitland-Niles was criticized on Instagram and he actually responded individually to, I think, three or four of those messages. Now, is there any need for that? In my opinion, no I've been critical of players lots of times, but I don't tweet them and, and tag them in it. I don't at them in it. You know, what's the point? What Do you think they're going to sit there and listen and take on what you're saying and, and give two fucks, basically, about what you think? Um, Ainsley Maitland-Niles actually, in my opinion, did the wrong thing in responding to them because he's given those morons airtime. You know, it's fine to criticise a player. It's fine to not think that he played particularly well. It's fine to think you can improve in certain areas. But to directly put that to the player via social media, I don't think is helpful in any way, shape or form. Um, particularly when it's a young player just making his name for himself. He's probably not as thick-skinned uh, as, as a seasoned pro who's played in stadiums of 50,000 people all booing him and you know, lighting flares and swearing at him and calling his mum every name under the sun. You know, this is different. We're talking about a young player who's coming through, who's being nurtured. I just think he's completely uncalled for. And I would urge our fans to stop because I don't see what benefit will come of it. Um, you know, it, it's just uncalled for, unnecessary, and it's rude. And, you know... As a supporter of the club, you're entitled to your opinion. Of course you are. I sit here every week and give my opinions to you guys. Uh, but 
there's a respectful way of airing that opinion. There's a way of venting it. There's a way of discussing it. And I just don't think that every single individual that criticizes a player needs to go directly to him. And for me, that was wrong. Fair play to Ainsley. He was a good sport. He didn't get abusive back. He didn't really, um, you know, get involved in sort of the the backwards and forwards, which is what I guess what these people wanted. It's attention, right? Um, you know, Ainsley responded respectfully, made a point of it, highlighted it to the media, I guess, by doing that, which is great. Uh, and those people have kind of been shamed now, haven't they? But it's just uncalled for. It's poor. And, and I don't want to see that sort of thing. And, and so hopefully, you know, this will be a lesson for lots of our fans and it will stop. Right, that's enough of me. It's time for this week's guest. My guest this week is TalkSport producer Patrick D'Angelo. Patrick, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna, mate. You're making your debut. How are you doing, first of all? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Uh, A little bit tired, but, you know, we're soldiering on, as they say. Um, Patrick, I want to get your thoughts on the win up at Huddersfield. Um, It was by no means an easy victory. I didn't think Arsenal played all that well, if I'm being completely honest. What was your assessment of of the game and and of Arsenal's performance? Um, Harry, to be honest, I'll be inclined to agree with you in terms of um, the performance. I was on on Twitter at the full time with Phil Arsenal fans very vocal as ever, um, uh, mo- mo- moaning about the way we approach the game. But I think, I think what Emery's, uh, to be honest, at, at this moment in time, all I care about are results and three points. <clears throat> I'll take one nil scrappy wins for the rest of the season, and I think every Arsenal fan should. But I think the way we um, we approach the game, I've seen a change in Emery. In, in, the way Emery's approaching games at the minute, I think he's got, I don't think he trusts the individual defenders. And so he's trying to approach the game by um, defending in numbers, really. And I think that's why I went with the three at the back, which I think was the right decision. Both goals come in, uh, assist from the win back. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. The performance could have been better. But at the end of the day, it's three points. And that's all we can ask for, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, I know it's easy to to look into the ins and outs of it and find so many faults, isn't it? Because, you know, we we expected, I think, given that we took the lead um, quite early on and then the second goal obviously came right on the stroke of half time. I don't know about you, but I Mm. thought Arsenal were going to go out there in the second half and really grab a foothold of the game. But it didn't really happen, did it? Um, What have you made of the whole Mesut Ozil situation? Because we haven't spoken about this. Um, And I'm interested to hear your thoughts because I think... It's it's something that's divided our fan base at the moment, isn't it? There there are fans that are desperate to see Messi as he'll return to the team, and there are others who are kind of like, "Meh, is he really that important?" So, where do you stand on it, and what do you think's actually gone on there? Uh, he drives me insane, Harry. He drives me insane. On on his day, as we all know, he's a very special player, but I think he uh, embodies everything that was wrong with the latter years of Arsenal Wenger's reign in terms of, I think he's a flat-track bully. I think he's amazing at home against teams in the bottom half. Um, and I think he tends to go missing in the big games, which I think everyone can agree on. Um, I was actually talking to my friend about Mesut the other day, and I think this is something that a lot of people may not take into account. And um, what happened to him in the summer was such a, such a big deal. It was it was absolutely massive. And I, I, I'm starting to question... Maybe there's something wrong with his. Maybe he's suffering from a form of depression or something. You know, when I, when I see him play, I'm not sure. I feel like he's fallen out of love with the game. I don't know about you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a fair point. I think you could definitely uh, take that into consideration because, like you said, that what happened in the summer was a massive deal. Um, obviously, for yeah. to have your national team sort of, in a sense, turn their back on you, and then other players were getting involved, weren't they? Coming out and saying things mm. when really it should have never got to that point. I think he feels hurt by that. Um, But I think that that could have been flipped. I think someone who is a top man manager maybe would have flipped that, maybe would have put his arm around Mesut and kind of been like, you know what, this has happened to you, but we value you here. Uh, And and that's not going to happen to you here. And, you know, let's support us and we'll support you and get you through it and let's get you back to the top of your game. I just feel like, and I've said this 
already earlier on in the podcast. I feel like if there was ever an example of a manager going into a club, putting his arm around the start and getting the best out of him after some poor performances, it's the Paul Pogba thing. You know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has gone in there, put his arm around him, and all of a sudden we're seeing Pogba turning impressive displays week in, week out. So do you not think mm. that maybe Unai Emery's handled this in the wrong way? I, I, I don't, actually. I think he, um, you know, he made him one of the five captains straight away, which uh, I think said a lot as soon as he walked through, uh, walked through the door. Um, he was starting games at the beginning of the season. And listen, Paul Pogba, I agree, he's playing very well, but he's doing exactly what he's asked of him. And I don't think Mesut pulls his weight and doesn't do what Unai wants, you know? OK, that's interesting. But then I would put this to you, because I, I say this to everybody that, that sort of takes that starts not that there's anything wrong with that but what how do you explain Mesut Ozil then when he is selected being given the captain's armband if Emery doesn't value him and doesn't think that he leads by example and does what he needs to do why give him the armband I'm not I, it's a tricky one isn't it but like, like, like I say he did put the faith in him made him one of the five captains I think it'd be even worse if uh, you know he, he it was announced as one of the five captains and then he plays and we go oh but actually you're not allowed to wear the armband. Let's, let's give it to uh, Lucas Torreira. You know, I think that would be even worse, to be honest. Okay, interesting, interesting. In terms of you know another player that has been in the papers a lot this season, Aaron Ramsey. We've heard today <laughs> yeah. that he signed a mega deal at Juventus. There are reports of it being worth four hundred thousand a week. I'm not sure if that's mm. entirely true because there's a couple of uh, well-known, well-respected Italian football journalists who have come out this evening and said, actually, that's not the case. It's not as much as that. Does it kind of now make sense to you why the club maybe felt that, you know, it was time to let Aaron Ramsey move on? We, we couldn't pay that sort of money, could we? No, but I don't think he was after that sort of money, was he? Uh, when we were having these negotiations. I, I'm absolutely gutted that Aaron's leaving. He's one of my, uh, my favourite players. I'd much rather keep him... I'd lose. I'd happily lose Mkhitaryan and Ozil if it meant keeping Aaron Ramsey. But listen, the club made their stance. It's a strong stance. They stuck by it, which I think we should respect. And uh, you know, to be honest, for, for, for the player, I think he'll do. I think he suits uh, Serie A really well. I think a new challenge will do him well, um, also. And it frees up money for us to go into the market in the summer, right? Yeah, that's right. And it, and he's got you know a real good chance of perhaps going on to, to win the Champions League. He's, he's certainly going to win yeah. the title there. Um, and, you know, the opportunity to play with Cristiano Ronaldo as well, one of the all-time greats. So I guess from Aaron Ramsey's point of view, it's a great move, uh, both financially and from a football standpoint. Uh, I think a lot of people have kind of written off Serie A lately, and I think that's a bit unfair when you take into account how far Juventus go in the Champions League, you know. It, th th there's got to be something about them, hasn't it? There's got to be some quality there. Um, what yeah, about okay. what about the formations that we've been playing then of late? I know, sort of jumping around a little bit, but we spoke about the the back line that he selected at the weekend, and you said you was happy with the back three overall, though this season. What do you think's worked better? Because you know we started the season, didn't we, with a back four? Then we kind mm. of abandoned that, and it seems like we keep chopping and changing, maybe because it's dependent on who's available. But in your eyes. What's the way forward? What's the system that Unai Emery needs to embed and, and stick with going forward? Well, mate, from the start of the season, for me, the, the two most important players are Lacazette and Aubameyang. They play well together. They like each other. They feed off each other. So I, I, I've always said they need to be in their best positions. I don't like Aubameyang wide. I'm really not a fan of that. He's a, he's a penalty box striker. Can you imagine playing Pippo and Zaggy out wide. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just because he's fast, it, it, it's okay to play him out wide. I don't like that at all. So I think those two need to be in the team and they need to be up front together. Now, whether we do that in a in a four four two, which we saw worked very, very well in probably our performance of the season, one of our best forms of the season, really, at uh, Craven Cottage against Fulham. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of the four four two. Um I also, I do think, though, given how terrible our defenders are individually, I, I think we can work in a 3-5-2. And I actually think he could get the best out of uh, Mesut Ozil as well, especially at home. So we have our wing-backs bombing on, then we can have Mesut Ozil playing in the hole behind the two strikers. That's something... I, we we kind of done that, right? Uh, um, when Tottenham came to the Emirates, in the second half, we had, we had Aaron Ramsey playing behind the two guys up top. I think that worked really well. 
So he needs to settle on a system eventually. Uh, I think he'll do that next season. And uh, I want to see those two guys in the team week in, week out, playing together. I don't know about you. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, I think there have been times where we've maybe affected the balance of the team a little bit by selecting the two of them. But when they're both scoring goals, it's very hard to leave any of them out, isn't it? And so I have sympathy for the manager there and I, I don't criticise him for that. Um, but yes... You, you, you non- do criticise him though, right? You're not, you're not a huge fan. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I criticise him pretty much every week. <laughs> no, you Why? Know, Why? Because... For me, there are things that Unai Emery has done that are, are wrong, in my opinion. And what I am what I can't deal with as an Arsenal fan is, you know, Arsene Wenger was a club legend. No doubt about that. I don't think anybody would question that. And I'm not saying that he should have stayed because I think we all got to the end of our tether. There was no doubt in my mind that it was time for Arsene Wenger to leave. Probably the year before he actually did. I would have said after he lifted the FA Cup against Chelsea, Uh, in that final, that was the time to say goodbye, you know, leave on a high. But what I will say is, I can't get my head around how certain supporters were so abusive towards Arsene Wenger, so angry towards him and and were waiting for any little mistake to call it out. And, And this is a man we're talking about as a club legend. And then a new manager comes in, which is fine. But people are scared to criticize him. Criticizing his selections doesn't mean that I want him sacked. Criticising his man management of certain players, again, doesn't mean I want him sacked. But I'm not going to sit there like a puppet and agree with things that I think are wrong. And, Mm. you know, for me, I've struggled with seeing other fans do that. And part of it, in my view, is the fact that they were so vocal, so adamant that Arsene Wenger had to go, that they're now almost embarrassed to criticise the replacement. And I think that's wrong. Um, I I think Unai Emery needs more time. But equally, the club obviously aren't going to back him in the transfer windows, as we've seen this this uh, winter. You know, there's reports of a quite a low budget in the summer again, and he's only yeah. On the I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not having those stories. I'm, I'm sorry. I spoke to a few journalists as well about this. It's, yeah, this is this is clickbait at, at its best. I'm I'm not. I don't believe any single word of that. I've got to tell you. But would you be surprised if the club announced there was only 45 million to spend? I wouldn't. That's the thing. Well. It was quite a pessimistic view, but mate, I, I would I would be surprised. You can't. All the fans know the money's out there. We know how much money they're taking in, and if, if they honestly think that they can they can give him forty million and let him crack on, I I, I think fans would be vocal. All right, look at it from this point of view. This is my last question to you as well, and I'm going to put this one. I'm going to throw this one out there to get you thinking and see what you think about this. Okay. Could it be that the club are not? totally convinced that Unai Emery is the long-term uh, the long-term solution for the managerial position. He was on a two-year deal. When have you ever heard mm. of a top club signing a manager on a two-year deal? That doesn't happen very often. They've been a little bit reluctant to back him financially. You know, you could argue that it's for financial fair play reasons and all that, but everybody else seems to get around it. So could it be that the Arsenal hierarchy and not entirely sure whether Unai Emery is the long-term solution for the managerial position at this moment in time. Yeah, I think I think you might be right, but I think it would be very naive of them just to, this, this new guy to come in. I mean, just remember, if the, the job's, all, it's almost like a poison tariff given the quality of the squad, um, you know, the, the amount of money that we're paying on our wage bill is, 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 is disgrace, it's disgraceful, really. To just have this new guy come in, just give him all your money and go, right, go on then, Go and do your best. I think that might be a little bit naive. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, but I can I, I, listen. I can see your point. But Arsenal fans out there, I understand if you want to criticise selections. You know, I don't think he knows his best team. I mean, I don't think Arsenal fans know their best team. I might, I might say uh, a formation and, and a lineup that you might disagree with, and the next person disagrees. He doesn't know his best team. I don't think Arsenal fans know the best team. But does it worry you that he doesn't know his best team, given that he's been in the job for this long? Because I would have thought that he would have had an idea of what his strongest side was by this point. And that's another thing that I can't quite get my head around at the minute. Well, no, I, I've been kind to agree with you there. But then you have to bear in mind the, the injuries that we do have are, you know, they're, they're, they're losing Hector Bellerin long term is devastating. It's, 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 it's poor from the club not to replace him. Um, I, I wanted Cedric Suarez on loan 
he would have been perfect. He ended up going to Inter Milan. He would have been ideal. I don't like playing Maitland Niles there. He's not a wing back. He's not a full back. Uh, I, I feel sorry for him. And I've seen some Arsenal fans getting on his case on social media as well. And that's, I, I don't like that at all. But what I do like about Unai is he's given every player a chance to, sh- to show what they're about. If he gets top four, this, make no bones about it, he's done a fantastic job. Agreed. And we are in the Agreed. race. We have got more points. We have scored more goals. We've got more away wins than last season. I think to say, some people saying we're not improving, <laughs> I mean, it's just outright wrong. I, I I wouldn't say we've not improved. I'd say we've not improved defensively. And that's my only thing. But look, as I said earlier on, I, I don't want him gone. I don't want him gone. I want him to be given time. But I want him mm. to be given a fair crack at it because at the moment I feel that he's not maybe getting that. And that's because of the club, not because of anybody else. It's not because of the supporters. It's not because of anything other than the club simply refusing to put their hands in their pockets for whatever reason. Um, and you know, and my fear is that with the Cronkies taking full control of this club, eventually mm. we're not going to know what money's coming in. We're not going to know anything because there'll be no requirement, no legal obligation no. to disclose those things. So, you know, that's my concern. But anyway, Patrick, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I know you've got to get off to work. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time out. Do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media and keep up with your brilliant work? Uh, yeah, I'm at Patrick DeAndre. I think I'm not, I'm not even sure of my uh, social media handle. I think it's Patrick DeAndre <laughs> Eight or something I'll, like that. I, yeah, I put the eight for you in right. So I'll stick it in the uh, description. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, good man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the invite. Cheers, mate. Anytime. Thanks, Harry. That brings me to the end of another episode. A massive thank you to Patrick D'Angelo. Massive thank you to our sponsors, Loserport. And of course, every single one of you who tuned in, whether it's via YouTube or via the audio, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, leave us a comment. It all helps. We are really grateful for your support. This is episode 50, actually. Um, If I'd have realized that before I started recording, I probably would have made a big thing about it at the beginning. But... Yeah, it's only 50. We're well on our way to 100. And and by the way, that's not including the preview show. So we've done way more than 50. uh, But this is our 50th review show. Uh, So a big thanks to everyone who supported us uh, along the way. The show is growing rapidly. uh, And I couldn't be prouder. You know, this is a platform uh, for us to discuss Arsenal, for me to share my views and opinions. And you guys are always welcome to contribute, of course. We've had a whole host of fantastic guests along the way. We've got more lined up in the coming weeks. Uh, So thanks once again for all your support. Without uh, you guys, this wouldn't be possible. And one more cheeky plug for my brand new show, Simply Serie A, the Italian football podcast. If you're interested, even have just a passing interest in Italian football, do head over there, check it out. We've got some great journalists on board, great contributors, and they're shedding some real insight and real light onto the Italian game. It's a historical competition and there's lots to discuss every week. So do join us, join me um, and listen to the show. I'd be really, really grateful. Uh, So don't forget to subscribe to that one too. And we'll be back next Tuesday because we're going to skip the review show this week. There's no need. There's no Premier League game uh, preview show, I should say. Uh, I'm going to skip the review show. Muddling my words. It's 10.30 at night and I haven't slept probably in three weeks. Oh, well. Until then, guys, take care. Bye-bye.